much older than uh, than uh, and Kemet. Somebody signed on over there. <laughs> all right, anyway, so this is a king seated, seated here. See the white crown of the south? These All these uh, images, they show up in Nubia before they show up in Kemet. So we know the civilization started from south to north. If the archaeologists had time, what else would have been discovered besides the incense burn? Anyway, so uh, let me just skip through these. This is the Sudanese National Museum. You can see some of the artifacts here. I don't want to get to what I actually, so you have some of the most amazing sculpture and statues in Sudan of some of the old kings. Um, look how powerful this is. These are mighty structures. And hardly anybody goes to see these. When I was in the National Museum, there was two people there, myself and my colleague. Mm. I'm sorry, it was three people, the guard <laughs> who was sleeping was there. That's, wow. that's what allowed me to take pictures because he was sleeping. Wow. There were three of us. Can you imagine in the National Museum? And so these are, these are images of powerful kings. We need to know more about this. And look, I snuck a picture in there to show you how difficult it is going around. Now, you talk about uh, having to go through deserts and sleep in deserts. It's tough in Sudan. It is difficult. So here's my colleague. And uh, before everybody else got on this bus, I was able to take a picture of the raggedy uh, transportation we had. Can you imagine something like this? The guy, the driver got in. I don't know what he poured. He lifted something up, poured something in, and, and we took off. <laughs> But it's very difficult getting around. So whether you catch a public bus or hire a car, it doesn't matter. Here we got stuck in the desert for eight hours. Wow. And said, I wasn't really where I figured I had a day or so. My brother had to walk a mile and a half to the mountain, climb the mountain to get cell phone reception. And I'm the only talk about lack of preparation. I'm the only one that had water. And it wasn't that much water. This brother was, to me, he was a hero. And I'm looking at my water, looking at him. I said, I don't think I want to give him my water because <laughs> we were stuck. I thought about it. I said, you know what? He's a hero. So I gave this brother my water, and I was shocked. I was shocked. He took the smallest sip and gave my water of all people to the driver who got us stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the driver had a bad clutch before we even went out in the desert. Here he is drinking my water. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the most ridiculous scene. And by this time we had been out there for hours, I had no energy left, none. It is burning hot in the middle of the desert. All I can do is take my camera out and document the madness. But I think it's going <laughs> stop it from occurring. This is how the energizer was. So it is tough getting to these sites, trust me. I'm, all right, so anyway, the greatest builder in the history of all Sudan is Taharka. Everywhere you see buildings by the great Taharka. So I wish we could say more. Anyway, there's great pyramid sites like in Nuri. You have uh, many, look, there's 223 pyramids, 223 in Sudan. So we went and, uh, you know, many pyramid sites, Jebel Barco, uh, many different sites. Here you have the great Amun Temple. This is one of the treats for me to be able to find the central axis and the Holy of Holies inside of the Amun Temple at Jebel Barkel and, um, here is how the temple may have looked if it was reconstructed. So when I go, I'm excited by the columns and pillars, but having read the text and the archaeological reports, I can imagine what it was in its heyday. Uh, look at all the artifacts. Uh, I'm going to just go through these quickly. Look at the beautifully made bed. Look at the rings made out of solid gold. Look how close they were to nature, birds, snakes, everything. Even on the beds you have closeness to nature everywhere. Look at the, the legs, ends and the, and the calf, hoofs, everything close to nature. God is sitting on her throne. This is powerful. This is what was found. We don't know what else is there. We just don't know. And um, a lot of these artifacts have been taken to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So those in Boston know more about Sudan than those in Sudan because it's not a tourist area. By the way, those sites that I showed you, no security. No ticket booths, nothing. You can do what you want the way you want. So it's just an area that no one or very few people care about. But the construction is so powerful. Here you have an article from 1923, the Boston Globe. And here it says, King Asphaltus sarcophagus is too heavy for the art museum floor. This is a 13 and a half ton coffin. We had to build a brand new floor just to hold this. Uh, so a lot of things that are just astounding, to say the least. And here you have uh, Asfelta on Milani, some of the most powerful rulers in the history of the Sudan. We need to more, know more about that. 
Uh, many of you have seen this at the Berkeley Flea Market t-shirts, bags. And here you see black and brown, beautiful images. Look at the almond-shaped eyes, the jewelry. Uh, here you have somebody with a leopard skin outfit. What do you think these are? No. What about this symbol? This is gold. Symbols of gold. And all over northern Sudan, you have people today mining for gold. There's a 10 year contract that the Turkish have taken out with the Sudanese to mine for gold. And they're still looking for gold today. Let me just show you the Merway Dam and I'll move forward. This was completed in 2008, the fourth cataract. Where I was showing you was uh, Nuri, El Kuru, uh, Gebel Barkel, these areas here. Uh, great site. So the fourth cataract completed a few years ago, it, it created a 108 mile long area and I was able to go to that region and uh, this is a high security site. We saw tens of thousands of people. We estimated about 10% of the people were Chinese workers in the area. This is a massive project that is, and so here you have three languages on all the signs. This is Chinese, English, it says now you've approached the construction site of the Merway Dam and then this is Chinese. I'm sorry, this is Arabic, excuse me, Arabic. English, Chinese, all of the signs. So it was a joint venture. This is the cataract, there's a lot of rocks, so it's hard to navigate in the cataract areas. And um, I had a chance to go to Hushel Garouf. This was the gold production and gold distribution site. So we, the word Nubia comes from the word nub, which means gold. The symbol I showed you a second ago, that's a symbol for gold. Neb or Nebu. It means gold. But anyway, Hushel Garouf is a gold production site. And what the University of Chicago found was 55 large stones that were used to grind up rocks in order to search for gold. And before the dam was built, even in the Hushel Garouf area, you had people still sifting the mining for gold. This was a gold distribution center for the kings and rulers. So you know it was an important site. At Hushel Garouf, I found uh, pot fragments, meaning it was a rich archaeological site. And here you have a shaft. What do you think this is? This is that Hushel Garouf. It's something, isn't it? It's a man-made, woman-made structure. Who knows? It's flooded. It takes time to excavate and find out. All I can do is record it and keep moving, because it's a long area, 108 miles. So uh, Ed Doma, this was a burial site. This is flooded. It's gone. Who knows all of what's at El Doma? All the archaeologists can do is make brief recordings of what was there and move on. And that's the same thing I was uh, able to do as well. Also, uh, here's a, a Kushite pyramid site at Et Teref. Here you have a pyramid structure. By the way, you never have a pyramid by itself. There's always a pyramid complex with, with related buildings. Who knows what the related buildings are because the area is now flooded at Merrillway. So this is how it looks now. Let's forget about it. It's gone. Everything's under water. So the people have seen this already. They already know that the area has been flooded by the government. And by the way, the Merway Dam, the Manasir people tried to blow the dam up because they don't agree with it. They didn't want to be moved from their homeland. And then this group here, the, the LA Times says these are Arab farmers. That's what they say. These are as Africa is not only in their appearance but also in their attitude. I went and the people said, you can't go among the monastery, they're too aggressive, it's not safe. Mm. I went, and by the way, when, when we were out in the desert, one of the guys walked about two miles, went to an old defunct train station, and he brought back some water. I said, I'm not drinking that. The water, what color do you think it was? It was brown. tan and brown. <laughs> they drank it, I didn't. And my buddy said, brother, you don't look well. I said, brother, I know I don't look well, but I'm healthy. <laughs> so he's like, I'm not drinking that. He drank it, and a day and a half later, he came down with dysentery. Yeah. So the day in which we were able to go, he couldn't, the, the main guy, he couldn't join me. So I had to go by myself, and I was told that these people are too aggressive, they're trying to blow up the dam, it's not safe. I went by myself, and that's the greatest laugh we had when I told them that I was told that they were too aggressive. These brothers, we, uh, we, we ate dates, we drank tea, and then when it was time to document the experience, the brothers walked out among their crops and said, shoot all of the date trees. We're farmers. This is our life. And share this is with as many people as possible. And that's what I did. So they're date farmers. They didn't want to move because that's their homeland. This is what gave them livelihood. Anyway, they would move to resettlement sites like El Mutaga, which is nothing more than the desert. You can pump all the water you want, but it doesn't make any difference. The, the, they're, they're farmers who now have no real viable farmland. So these are some of the brothers from Dongola. Let me move forward. This is my colleague here, Sorwat, 
who helps me. This year, this is his family, by the way. Um, near Khartoum. He's a member, sorry, he's a member of his family. He is in Germany now. He, he and his wife just had a baby, so he couldn't join me this summer. So uh, what he was able to do is have his brother help me. And so the brother, who's a naturopathic doctor, left his, left his family to help me in the field. And so uh, this is his family. And um, so he was able to help me, excuse me, in the field. So we went to the Down Dam, the second cataract. So this is gonna flood a 40 mile long area and there's at least five major archeological sites and at least five to 10,000 people will be, be displaced when the Dow Dam is complete. When is this gonna be constructed? Don't know. There's no timetable because the Sudanese government does not want the local people to know the timetable and begin to organize as they've done before. So we go to the Dow Dam. Here's a brother that we've just met. So took us in. Uh, this is Dab Shembo, his family took us in, and uh, in the, they're Nubian, by the way, in the northern Dow Dam area. These are his children. This is uh, one of the local friends. And um, uh, you can't see this that well, but this is a typical Nubian home in the area that will also be flooded. And um, he also had, he called the young brothers to take me to some of the archaeological sites that will be flooded once the Dow Dam is complete. So we catch the boat across the Nile, and here's a place called Kuma. And Kuma is a mini 